Hello everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. We're back with another Frequently Asked Questions Friday. So please hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already subscribed, that'd be absolutely wonderful. And also hit the little bell thingy next to it because apparently that will notify you that we have a new video. Okay, we've got some great questions this week in Fact Friday. Um, and there's some technical ones. But this one I'm going to start off with actually came from our academy. And it was posed, it's been posed a few times, and we've touched upon it in other discussions. But it was one of our academy members was talking about this. How do you deal with massive self-doubt? How do you get yourself out of the funk? How do you get creative again? How do you get inspired? That's a paraphrase of a question that was asked because this actually is probably the most frequently asked question I get. Um, inside of our community, um, people are obviously very honest and it's a wonderful community where we all share. And this has been asked by quite a few of the Academy members. And just in general, I know when you're working in close quarters with people, you're working with band members, other producers and engineers and mixers, this is the kind of stuff that people do bring up when you've been working with them for a long time and you build relationships. And it's a freaking amazing question. I just want to share with you that I have been through absolutely massive self-doubt. And it doesn't really ever fully go away. There's a couple of good reasons. And one of those, of course, is factually, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. So here I am, you know, in the 2000s. I built my career starting in like the early mid 90s, you know, through now into the, you know, 2000, nearly hitting 2020, depending on when you're watching this. And we had bands like you know, Bill Haley and the Comets and Elvis and Little Richard. And we had blues before that and jazz, and Miles Davis. And then we had all the great rock bands of the 60s and the, the soul and Stax and Motown stuff of the 60s. And we had the 70s in Britain with Pink Floyd and of course Zeppelin. You get it. You understand my point. I mean, all of this absolutely incredible music from jazz and blues and rock and country and classical music. Go back even further. Go back to Beethoven and Mozart and Schubert and Schumann and Elgar and all the rest. Holst, you know, all of these incredible people have come before us. So there is a certain amount of self-doubt that all of us have because we just put on a pair of headphones and listen to some music that blows our minds. That's okay. When I hear some 90s or, you know, producer saying, you know, blowing their own horn and stuff like that. I'm like, that's great. God bless you. But, you know, I've been in a room with guys like Jack Douglas and Shelly Yakis and work with them and they're super humble and they've worked on the records that influenced all the records that we made through the 90s and 2000s and stuff like that. So you understand where I'm coming from. So there's a big part of that and that is okay. I think it's actually called humility. And it's okay to be humble and realize that we're just standing on the shoulders of some of the most talented girls and guys that ever lived. We live in a world where just some of the most incredible music has already been made. It doesn't mean you can't make incredible music. Of course you can. Go out and make incredible music. It's also fantastic to feel humbled by that amazing music that's come before. All of the people I admire, all of the people you hear me talk about every day on this channel that I've had the privilege to share a room with and talk to, all of them talk about these great artists and these great records, whether it's The Beatles, whether it's Aretha Franklin, you know, whatever it is, Ray Charles, Ray Charles for goodness sake, you know, when you talk about those, Stevie Wonder, when you talk about these kind of artists, and then all the great blues, I mean, I just want to, oh, and then, you know, go back to Robert Johnson, you know, the, the point is like all of this stuff made us who we are. So it's okay. It's okay to feel humbled by it and feel like, you know, we're just a little cog in the works. That's okay. However, 
I also understand anxiety and depression. And I've been through all of those and I know so many creatives have. To me, the best people I've ever worked with have all of those issues. They go through massive anxiety and massive self-doubt and massive, you know, feelings of depression. It's very, very, I say very 50 times, incredibly common. So if you're going through that, you are not alone. And as the old phrase goes, this too shall pass. And for some people, it's like, take a break, walk away from the situation, go and do something else. I remember reading with Pete Townsend um, years ago that when he has those feelings of massive melancholy, that's actually when he writes the most. He seizes it and it, may, it, it, it he forces himself to work in that feeling. I've read that as well from many different artists, but that isn't necessarily everybody's process. The reality is this too shall pass. Just Know that however you feel, whether it be for five minutes or five hours, you will come out the other side. Personally, I just work harder. I used to kind of hide under the bed covers and stay away from the world. And unfortunately, you know, that just didn't work for me because I'd have these massive fits of creativity. I'd pick up the guitar, I'd practice for six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 hours solidly and then sleep in the next day and feel really bad about myself and then do it again. So it was like binging. Nowadays, I have so many things that I do that I have to pace what I do all day. And I do think that um, for me, my personality is multitask, do lots of things. That's what keeps me out of my funk, out of my head, allows me to break out of it. What is your process. Do you feel these things? Are you anxious? Are you go, do you go through depression? Do you feel so humbled by stuff that you feel paralyzed? That happened, that's happened to me a lot. What is your experiences and how do you get through that and how do you come out the other side? Please, this will be a fantastic topic to discuss. All I can say is you're not alone. The best in the world are the humblest in the world. I don't see people running around saying, I am the sound of hits and I'm amazing that really are amazing. The most talented people in the world. I mean, I've, I've been blessed to work with so many incredible talents and they all talk about everybody else first. They talk about all the incredible people that have got them there. They don't talk about themselves, about what an amazing talent they are. They go, I was blessed, ask Shelley. Talk about Shelley. He'll be like, oh, I worked with John Lennon. It was incredible. You know, he, he just wants to talk about the people that he was so privileged to work with. So humility um, is okay. If you feel humbled, God bless you, it's okay. All right, please leave me a whole bunch of comments and questions below, particularly for Fact Friday, but of course, give us your experiences. Have you been through the same stuff? Do you continue to go through it? And I just want to let you know, you're not alone. So let's do another question. This one's more of a technical one. Do you use automation in EQs? Let's say you have a guitar intro where you want a fat tone, but when the rest of the instruments come in, it might sound muddy. Will you then automate EQ for the guitar? Heck yes, I love automating EQ. Um, if you have watched any of my breakdowns, you'll see that I do that kind of stuff all the time. Now, for instance, when you come to the end of a song and it gets super, super dense and a lead guitar comes in and a lead vocal are going and it's like wailing away, maybe there's a duel, you know, Joe Perry, you know, like soloing with Steven kind of thing. Yeah, let's go for it. You know, that kind of like classic Jimmy Page, you know, Robert Plant kind of thing where there's a battle uh, of lead guitar and vocals. What do you do there? Well, I do a couple of things. Um, and one of those, of course, is to take the main guitars that are all competing in the sort of three to 5K range, and I will dip EQ in there. Sometimes I'll side chain it, so every time the lead guitar plays, it actually dips some EQ out to fit it in nicely. Another thing I'll do is have, as you're suggesting here, maybe a main rhythm in a verse, and when it goes to the chorus, maybe I'll brighten it a little bit more. Maybe I'll just make it a little bit edgier as well as turning it up. I do it on kick drums all the time. The kick drum can be like thud, thud, thud in the verse. The chorus comes in, it's turned up ever so slightly because the, the song got fatter, but a little extra click, snap on the kick comes up. 
and that just makes it feel like they're digging in a little bit harder. And of course, it keeps the, the kick a little bit more present in the mix. So I do all of those kind of things. And I think automating EQ is a secret weapon, and it is the difference between a really good mix and a great mix. Automation, full stop, will take your mix to the next level. So always employ it wherever you can. I know a lot of people don't like to do it because it's time consuming, but it can really, really make a mix absolutely amazing. Do you always send all drums to a drum bus, all guitars to a guitar bus, etc.? Yes, when mixing in the box, pretty much. Yeah, if I'm mixing in the box, I'll have like drums as a stereo bus. I'll have all the guitars on the stereo bus, rhythm guitar, stereo bus, maybe lead guitars. Um, similarly, on the console, um, I've got the, all the drums coming up. Well, the, the live drums are coming up on the first eight. And then the if they're samples, they come up here on 35, 36. And then they're all controlled by a VCA fader here. So one overall fader um, controlling the balance. Um, but that's not a bus, that is a VCA fader. It's just a fader that controls the volumes going to the master bus. There's no audio passing through this fader. That's just a control. Um, so yes, I do. Um, but when I mixed on a knee for years, I used to have an 8058, a 24 channel, uh, Neve console, which was beautiful. When I had that console, I never bust anything. I would have everything coming up on faders and um, I might create a parallel bus, like a, a pair of faders with some really heavily compressed drums, but I let everything on the console just kind of live. There was something and a weight, you know, as a lot of people say warmth, I like to say weight. There was a weight to that console, which was just fantastic. Everything sounded larger than life through it. I didn't feel like I needed to have lots of bussing in between before the master bus. Now, with the SSL, with dynamics on every channel, providing compression and EQ, also mixing hybrid inside of um, Pro Tools, I tend to find I'm using certain levels of compression all along the way. But when mixing in the box, yes, I do. I will have a drum bus, but I'll also have probably like, you know, well, definitely a kick bus, a snare bus, a tom bus, cymbals, overheads, hi-hats maybe on one, a rooms could be bussed together if there's multiple room mics. And then I can get a blend of all of those before they hit a drum bus. And then the drum bus could also be duplicated and squashed harder and be a parallel drum bus. I may even have a third drum bus where I do some like really super fast attack and release um, on the kick and snare going pop, 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 just to add some thwack back in. So no shortage of bussing of instruments. And I like it because I may have, somebody may send me two rhythm guitars aside on a chorus. So a pair on the left and a pair on the right. I can just send that to one stereo bus and then I can control the volumes in the choruses and push them up and down where needed. Rather than going in and individually trying to control four, I've now got one stereo fader that I can just go boom, up and down, turn it up, turn it down. Um, so there is an advantage to bussing it is that you get overall control of the instruments that you have sent to that bus. It's really nice. Plus, of course, you can compress an EQ on that bus as well. So yes, I do. Um, I like it. I think it's very effective and I would definitely suggest getting into doing that. Would you ever mix and master a full album within one single project file for faster workflow? The only times I've had that done are uh, when tracking live. For instance, um, a couple of years ago when we tracked the whole of the first Van Halen album at Sunset Sound with a bunch of teenage kids, it was fantastic. They learned the album. We tracked it live in one day. In fact, live in just a handful of hours. It was really a beautiful thing. So we did that and we ended up tracking that like one song after another. So for faster workflow, as in recording, it worked because you're tracking a song and then you're swapping out a guitar player, different guitar players coming in or somebody else is singing. And you know, within one minute, you're tracking another song. Maybe they do a take and then they roll into a second take straight away and you haven't got all these playlists. So when it comes to recording, it is definitely faster. You don't have to close down the session and open up a new session and you know, go in and name your tracks or whatever you might do. The point is, is I get it. It works when you're recording 
on the go, super, super fast. However, if you want me to be honest, I pathologically hate it for mixing. I do not think it's faster. Um, for mastering, yes, if I had a whole bunch of stereo tracks, I, you know, it would be fun to have more in a row because it's only a stereo track. But when it comes to mixing, it makes navigation really, really difficult. Because if you've got your session set up so that your track starts a couple of bars into the session, you can tap in and out and go back to full screen on that, no problem. When you're working on like 20 songs or 15 songs in a row, and it's this huge long session, you can double tap, at least in Pro Tools, and accidentally go right out and see the whole thing or lose your point. It's just, and then you're sitting there going, what was it, track seven? And you go, trust me, it's not, when it comes to mixing, I find it really, really stressful. Also, what ends up happening is you do, if you do a ton of edits across like 10, 12, 15 songs of an album, you know, while mixing, you put so much stress on your CPU with all of this stuff going on and you might have tons of different plug-in options and everything. And before you know it, the computer's like, and you've got the beach ball of death, you know, if you've got a Mac and all that stuff. For me, mixing should be one song in a session, because a song takes some time to set up, so I just put it in. So those few times that I am tracking out of necessity in a row, we will take that song and put it into its own session. And we'll open up that session and work just on that song and then close it out. Because the other thing is, of course, is that you can change some automation and accidentally turn the snare drum up in the song before. You have to be so careful when you've got those 10, 15 songs in a row that you don't mess it up. Yeah, for me, for mixing, I don't think it improves workflow. For tracking, when you're, especially when doing something live um, and all the guys and girls are in the room playing together, yes, I can see the advantage, but then I would take those songs and put them into individual mix tracks. So anyway, that was fantastic. Please, as ever, leave a whole bunch of comments and questions below. Remember, this is where we read our frequently asked question. As far as the conversation about, you know, depression, anxiety, you know, um, getting into a funky zone and trying to break out of it. If you have been in any of those places, which I'm sure many of you have, I know I have, I know so many of my friends, some of the most talented people in the world I've ever met do, please leave your experiences below. It would be so amazing to talk about it. All I can say is you're not alone, and this too shall pass. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Thanks ever so much for watching. Mm -hmm.